vision. Welcome to the D list, the show where I list things and my name begins with a D. But today, my name is not Dave. For today, we are all Jimothy. Let's talk about Wits. The beloved variety show Wits is ending its run on Minnesota Public Radio, and while we have been assured that the podcast version will continue, it still feels like the end of an era. Wits was a wonderful blend of sketch comedy, genuine conversation, improv games, and music that could be smart, thoughtful, moving surreal, and silly at any moment, with a roster of guests that includes some of the funniest and most talented artists on the planet, all helmed by the brilliant John Moe. And today, I'm looking back at my favorite segments from this always entertaining show. So invite your favorite Beckany and call up Cop Squadron as we begin the countdown. Now, first up, an honorable mention goes to Support for Wits. Support for Wits comes from an excited Labrador puppy who urges you to throw the ball, the ball, the ball, the ball, the ball, throw the ball, or the stick, the stick, the stick, the stick, throw the stick, the stick, the stick, throw it, throw it. This is any time John mentions the fake public radio sponsors of the show. And from cursive writing, a skill that will always come in useless. They are probably too brief to be considered segments in their own right, but they are always hilarious. We get additional funding from Willem Dafoe celebrating 30 years of being 50 years old. <laughs> John Moe plays the company's new HR guy who tries to break the ice and get to know the employees with a game of two truths and a lie. You need to come up with three things about yourself, but only two of them are true, and then everyone has to guess. So, two lies no, and... No, 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 two truths. It backfires horribly when none of the employees can comprehend the rules of the game, and some of them seem to have sinister motives. One, I spent the night in the office last night. Two, I was naked the whole time. And three, you have no idea what I'm capable of. John has a knack for playing the hapless sane person trapped in some illogical world of chaos, and his attempt to wrangle these psychopaths is right up his alley as a performer. Jimothy, are, are you, um, do you know the rules to two lies, two truths, and a bag? I think there's a bag, right? You put the lie in a bag? That's how we played it when I was a kid in Maine. Well, I, I didn't get a bag. And while sketch comedy rarely gives you particularly deep supporting characters, a great comedy sketch will give you specific supporting characters. One, I have soup for lunch every day. Two, I am divorced. Three, my name is Michael. Michael, those things are all true. <laughs> yes, because one, I'm not a liar. Two, lying is wrong. Three, I have morals. True, true, true. And the employees here are all funny and distinct with clear motivations even if they're nonsensical motivations. One, I lie about everything. Two, I am telling the truth. Three, I've lied once already. Boom, did I blow your minds? One of Wit's most popular recurring features is various forms of internet content theater. This is dramatic readings of actual weird or misguided posts found on the internet. Over the course of the show, they've gotten a lot of mileage out of things like Amazon Review Theater and WikiHow Theater. But for my money, the pinnacle of the internet content theater format was in an episode with Danny Pudi and Harmar Superstar. This is Cat Fancy Writer's Guidelines User Comment Theater. Oh, that's right. These are all just comments not from anywhere on the Cat Fancy website, but specifically from the Cat Fancy website's page for content submission guidelines. Why do you only accept submissions between January and May? I have a great story about taking cats to the cottage that I want to submit now! You might think that such a narrow source of comments wouldn't provide nearly as many opportunities for weirdness as something broader like Amazon or WikiHow. You would be wrong. Also, your submission guidelines have a very stern tone that actually invites potential writers to look elsewhere. I could have written the guidelines that would actually welcome writers. It's a shame because I could have been a valuable contributor. Uh, apparently, people who want to submit their writings to Cat Fancy are the most passionate people on earth, and they are not happy with the submission guidelines. I am surprised that an author's past work is requested. What difference does it make what they wrote before? Is it not what they write for Cat Fancy, which is important? Well, except the comments Janie Winterbauer reads. They, they all seem to be pretty happy. Your writer's guidelines are crystal clear, and I understand why you require samples of previously published writing. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the cast reads from many people who clearly know so much more about what it takes to run a good cat magazine than... The people who run the world's most famous cat magazine. The one thing 
I need to know is not included. Do you accept articles about cats <laughs> that live both indoors and outdoors? <laughs> One of the most beloved and consistently brilliant sketches on Wits is Pop Song Correspondences, where we hear the other side of a conversation in a famous song, which usually involves taking the lyrics very literally. Pop Song Correspondences. A transcript of the staff meeting at the Hotel California after Don Henley's visit. This can take a few forms. Sometimes the song doesn't actually exist in the sketches world. The lyrics are just part of the correspondence. And sometimes the song was actually released in the sketches world, like it was released in our world, and the characters are just reacting to it based on the information about the writing of the song that they have in their world. See, in fact, he has released a song all about his visit here to the Hotel California. But it's such a lovely place. Didn't he like our welcome poem? Actually, he used it in his song, but you know what? I, I think he was making fun of us. Welcome to the Hotel California. This particular installment is unique in that the characters are merely reacting to the song rather than directly engaging with the songwriter. Where's the chef? Yeah. I mean, can you tell me about this feast? Oh, well, yeah. yeah. We take this animal and uh -huh. then we let it loose. Well, well what, what, what kind of animal is it? Is, it's, is it it's a beast. It's a, that's all we know. It's, it's kind of like a cow combined with a mongoose uh -huh. and a wolverine. I, we get them really cheap and boy, is it angry. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, it tries to escape or attack and then we stab it. With, with, with steely knives? Yeah, steely yeah. knives. Dave Foley is no stranger to playing a stressed out boss frustrated by his employee shenanigans and man, do these employees engage in shenanigans. Robbie, what happened when Mr. Henley attempted to check out I let him, I said, whenever you'd like to check out, that's fine. I printed up a receipt, I said, thank you. Such a lovely face. Did you notice his face? Yeah, that's yeah. Yes. Really nice. yes. And then? I told him uh, I, he could never leave. I liked him. I wanted to be friends. An occasional target of Wits parody sketches was the greatest comic strip of all time, Peanuts. The Wits Peanut sketches would bring the anxiety and existential dread to the forefront, making it more faithful to the original comic strip than some of the licensed adaptation and merchandise. I guess they just have that Twin Cities knack for the source material. John Moe would always play the consistently depressed Charlie Brown, and the guests would play the other kids. This particular version of the sketch was performed twice, once with Julia Sweeney as Lucy, and once with Paget Brewster as Lucy. In the sketch, Lucy tries to get Charlie Brown to kick the football as always, and in the process makes him doubt everything he thinks he knows. Good grief. I think that grief may actually be the key to your situation. Your fits started when you were just a kid, remember? Fits? When your beagle puppy died, you- what, Died? Died? What? No. What do you mean, died? S Snoopy is, is fine. I fed him this morning. He died of the puppy influenza when he was a couple weeks old, Charlie Brown. Honestly, finding out that a huge chunk of his life has been all in his head would be pretty true to Charlie Brown's character. Then again, lying to Charlie Brown to make him doubt himself would be pretty true to Lucy's character. It plays both ways. It might be a bit dark and unsettling, but really, the canon Peanuts world has always been full of coldness before you get to that happiness, warm puppy stuff. Kick the football. Snoopy is alive. Kick the football. He puts on sunglasses and calls himself Joe Cool. <laughs> Burris takes John Moe to visit a business he has a share in, the ranch where most of America's dads are bred. Yeah, it's true. I have a partial ownership in a dad ranch up near Thief River Falls. I love getting up there, checking the dads, getting in and out of the city. In fact, I was just heading up there now. Want to come along? What follows is dad jokes. Hey, jokes about dads. Well, 85% of dads in America are raised here in Minnesota. It's dad country. Iowa has corn, Minnesota has dads. They grow them, feed them, nurture them, and when the time is right, ship them out to families all over the country. Ah, here we are, the big recliner dad ranch. It's one of those sketches that plays with well-trod familiar stereotypes, 
but it's just silly and different enough in its context to come together for something strange and delightful. This guy over here, he's, he's a ways off from going out into the world, right? This one playing Xbox? No, that's the new breed. Marlene, tell him about these dads. It's a hybrid of an adolescent and a traditional dad. <laughs> it's actually very popular. It's called a man-child. Oh. And there is no better confused dad than a confused dad played by Bill Corbett. Hey, Pops, I just crashed your car and I scored the winning touchdown and me and Becky are getting married. What do you say? Gosh, son, there comes a time in a man's life when the right thing you can't go wrong with a big piece of steak. My slippers now. Now, Richard Nixon, there was I saw Lover Boy uh -oh. in uh -oh. concert. Hey, there, there. The Wits Game Show, none of us can relate to that. The Wits Game Show is a recurring improv game feature where the guests make up songs or performances based on the prompts given by John Moe and the writers. Occasionally, these prompts involve emus. Your mother has become an emu. In this installment, relatable comedian Maria Bamford and relatable singer-songwriter Brandi Carlisle are tasked with making relatable monologues and songs, respectively, out of completely unrelatable premises. And Brandi Carlisle is really, really good at this. Uh, you return home to find your house covered by an enormous towel. Her songs are, of course, short, but they're surprisingly fully formed. You can leave home when you turn 18. You can leave home when you feel your dreams come real. Because that's how you feel. And you can come home when you're all tired out. When you get knocked down, when you're all out of shout, and then... Your home's your friend But you can't go out when the sun is in the sky If you're an owl And you can't come home when your house is covered by A giant towel And of course Maria Bamford is great She's just so lovably earnest, genuinely assessing how she would react in these crazy situations You go on a blind date and it turns out to be Bigfoot Oh my gosh, uh, number one, I'm on a date, and, uh, or two, we have so much in common. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of wooly, brushy hair all over my body uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, make me want to hide in the woods, um, but uh, I think, you know, as long as he has some kind of, you know, spiritual practice, the Wits Game Show tends to be about capturing weirdness, but this particular installment managed to capture a lot of warmth as well. Damn. Murder Cat. Did you secure the deadbolt? Yes. Bear traps all set? Yes, I'm not stupid. I can hear you whispering. Is my husband in danger? <laughs> not if he's a fighter. This series of sketches has a very simple premise. A cat named Murder Cat murders people. That's pretty much it. Hey, we all love and yet distrust cats, right? So that makes this sketch relatable. Everybody, keep calm. Murder Cat is walking in here. Uh, he, he just finished a kill, so we're actually quite safe. And after playing hapless straight men, clueless lackeys, or the occasional weirdo freak, it is a lot of fun to hear John play possibly his greatest role ever as a cat. He's wearing England's clothes. Uh. And is he... He's walking around like Glenn? <laughs> but what truly solidifies Murder Cat as a Wits classic is the greatest theme song in the history of sketch comedy. All cats want to murder people. That's a fact, says science. But only one cat. Yes, pop culture is overflowing with Star Wars and Star Wars parodies. Yes, it is almost impossible to find a new angle for a Star Wars parody. Yes, it seems that basically every potential joke that could possibly be made about any aspect of the Star Wars universe has already been made by someone. Yes, Star Wars as a comedy well has pretty much been tapped dry. On the other hand, Kristen Schaal as Darth Vader. I want these rebels alive, captured and not killed. Do you understand? Yes, yes Lord, Lord Vader. Vader. Dead, they are no use to me, and therefore, what, what is going on with my voice? 
There's a there's a helium leak in Sector 7, Lord Vader. Kristen Shaw as Darth Vader. Where's Grandma Tarkin? I would have a word with him about competence around here. Did you say Grandma Tarkin? Yes. Like Grandma Tarkin? <laughs> yes, what of it? Kristen Shaw as Darth Vader. What the Darth? There's a lot of Darths. Sidious, that's a Darth. Ball, and those are just the famous ones. Darth Girlton, Darth Sebastopol. I work out with a Darth named Hatad, which is Darth backwards, but a family name. Coincidence, right? Nothing else matters. This sketch has Kristen Shaw, one of the funniest human beings with one of the most distinctive voices in history, playing Darth Vader. That is all you need to know. Such insolence will not be tolerated. Say goodbye to each of you forever unless you reunite in hell. <laughs> Just kidding, you knucklehead. Kristen Shaw as Darth Vader. Allow us to present Monopoly. In it, most players are driven to bankruptcy. It will remind people of the poverty and despair they're currently enduring. Wix loves to take the mundane and make it surreal. But sometimes everyday life in pop culture is surreal enough as it is. And this sketch reinforces just how surreal Monopoly is by hypothesizing how it came to be. So uh, who is the player in this game? Oh, anything. From a shoe to a thimble to a small dog to an iron. We base the characters on the very first nouns that popped into our heads. But what happens if my iron lands on a street someone else owns? Then they charge you rent just for being on the street, of course. One of the hallmarks of great comedy is saying something that we, the audience, haven't heard before, or at least haven't heard put in that way. But once we do hear it, it just all seems so obvious. You know that thing in the real world where you can't buy a house until you own the street and all the streets that are similar to it? Yes, Whatever. I'm familiar with that. Well, it's in the game. We grew up with Monopoly. It's always been there. We just accept it. And even if we may have made the occasional joke about its more noticeably weird elements, most of us haven't really stepped back to look at just how little sense any of it makes especially in the context of when it first came out. It's unfair and frustrating. We will rip families apart at the very moment they're trying to have fun together. Does Monopoly have a fun cartoon mascot? You bet. A banker with a top hat and monocle. The personification of all we hate here in the Great Depression. People will pay money for that. When John Moe isn't playing the straight man in a sketch, sometimes he can play pretty far off the deep end. And there is no end deeper than his version of Tom Waits. Greetings, ladies and gentle subjects, and all the fishes left to die in the trees. I'm Tom Waits, and I sound like Cookie Monster's drunk grandfather. The Wits Waits frequently performs educational or motivational tapes wherein the listener just Let's Tom Waits seep into their brain. In my favorite Tom Waits sketch, Waits' mission is to cure you from having the songs from Frozen stuck in your head. You know, there are a lot of things in this world that are frozen. The heart of one-eyed Jim, the bartender down at the discount strip joint. The eyes frozen in fear of a shrieking cow demon with whom I went to junior high. The surreal, disturbing Tom Waits-ness of it all is a logical counterbalance to catchy Disney songs. Janie, like everybody, I love and fear Tom Waits, but I still have these Frozen songs stuck in my head. But what really puts this installment over the top is the appearance of present-day Bobcat Goldthwait as 1980s Bobcat Goldthwait. Do you want to build a snowman? Sure, why? Why would you build a snowman? It's just like Oliver North. It'll melt when it's on trial. <laughs> Colin Hanks answers dumb questions about his dad. Ah, the simplest premises can be the most enjoyable. Do you ever get together with Peter Scolari's kids for recreational cross-dressing? <laughs> Only on Sunday afternoons. All right. If you win an Oscar, will your dad say, oh wow, one Oscar, that's nice. <laughs> Probably, yes. Okay. Not only does this showcase the Wits team skill for the most brilliantly stupid lightning round questions, it also showcases what a good sport Colin Hanks yes. is. Have you ever just let loose and cried a whole bunch during a baseball game because don't tell me what to do, dad. <laughs> Why do you think I'm such a huge fan of hockey? 